and there is Facebook. Good evening, Prophet David Taylor here for my Thursday night teaching on No More Genies, okay? So I want to welcome those of you that are watching me on uh, Facebook Live. I want to welcome those of you that are watching me on Periscope. I want to welcome those of you that are watching the replay on YouTube. I may get to a point where I do some YouTube lives. I'm not sure about that yet. And then I'm working on some other uh, stuff as well. But I want to welcome all of you that are watching me live. And I want to welcome all of you that are watching the replay. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Please like and share. You're going to hear me say that quite a bit throughout the video. Because when God releases a prophetic word, that word needs to go across the world. Because somebody out there needs to hear it. Somebody out there needs to be edified by it. Somebody out there needs to be encouraged by it. So if you're coming on live or if you're watching on the replay, however you're watching, please like and share this video. Okay? Because somebody out there, again, needs to hear it. It can make a difference. And I'll, I actually i am going to show you why later, why that's true. Okay? So... Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start off, as always, with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive right in. All right? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you just thanking you for access to your presence, thanking you, O oh God, uh, for this grace in which we stand. Thank you, O oh God, that we are not justified before you because of anything that we do, but because of what Jesus did. So I thank you, O oh God, for his blood. Thank you, O oh God, for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Uh, Lord, I come to you and I surrender. Uh, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill, me my, fill my mind, my brain, my heart, my tongue, my lips, my hands, everything. Uh, Lord, I surrender to you so you can speak through me, so you can breathe on me and through me and in me, O oh God, so that your word might be released and disseminated unto the body of Christ, Lord. So let everything be done according to what you want done, that you might be glorified and that the saints might be edified, O oh God, and that the demons might be terrified, so we can establish your kingdom, your eternal kingdom, and tear down the kingdom of darkness, tear down the lies, and break through and see the light of God through the scriptures and the rhema word of the Holy Spirit. So I thank you for it, I believe you for it, and I decree and declare it done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, now we're going to do a quick review. Now... In general, the overview, the umbrella of what I do here on Thursday nights is a teaching called No More Genies. And No More Genies stands for getting rid of the genie concept of God where, whereby you think God and his kingdom is magic, okay? Because you don't understand the difference between faith and magic. So you think you can just say a few words, you think you can rub the magic lamp, you, you think you can do whatever you want to do and somehow... God is going to take his mighty hand and wave it across your life and fix all your problems. That is genie concept, okay? Because God don't follow us, we follow him. God doesn't serve us, we serve him. God doesn't bow down before us, we bow down before him. You see what I mean? And so that whole idea that you can just pop your fingers and just, you know, have God do whatever you want, that's genie concept. That's why so many people preach it and teach it. That's why so many people believe it. Because you want God to be this all-powerful genie that does what you say. So uh, instead, and the reason I'm so personally passionate about that is because I have seen people let their kids die because of genie concept. I have seen people that uh, did crazy things in the name of their faith or crazy things in the name of, of religion or crazy things because of a mis or misinterpretation or misunderstanding of the scriptures. And their kids ended up dead. Okay? Because they got the wrong idea. They got genie concept. I have seen people just, you know, do what we call tempting God. Would you do crazy things and then you demand that the Lord save you or fix you or heal you or whatever. And that's what the devil said in, in the wilderness. He told the Lord to throw himself off of a mountain and God would catch him. And then he quoted a scripture. Okay, that was genie concept. That was the wrong interpretation of that scripture. Okay, so that's what NMG, No More Genie, stands for. No more genie concept of God. No more spending any time with the wrong ideas about God because it can mess you up and cost you your life or cost the life of someone that you love. Okay, now, so that's the overall umbrella of what I do here on Thursday nights. I come on here on the second Thursday night 
of each month at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time to teach about No More Genies. Okay? Now, the series I've been working on, uh, and tonight is part four or five, I believe. But the series I've been series I've been working on is called "We Do It Wrong." Now, again, I strongly encourage you because I can't give you all the content and all the videos I've done so far. But I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to the "We Do It Wrong" series from the beginning because I take a lot of time, especially in the first video, extensively to explain what I mean by that. But again, just to give you. A quick overview. We preach what we call, when I say we, I primarily mean Western American Protestants. We preach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we do not preach the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. One more time. We preach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we do not preach the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. What we preach is, born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. Jesus preached the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. For the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. For the kingdom of heaven is likened unto that. That's what the Lord preached. He preached the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He did not preach born again, born again, get saved, get saved. Miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. He only mentioned born again one time in John chapter 3 when he was talking to Nicodemus. And he only mentioned born again in the context of unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord preached. And that's what we're supposed to be preaching. And so if you've been following this series, you've discovered that if we just look at the stuff that Jesus was talking about, if we look at his parables, there's so much life-changing truth. And there is also understanding. You will understand life. You won't just understand how the kingdom works. You'll understand life. Like last week, I talked about wheat and tares. And I talked a lot about why God, why does God allow? Because the Lord says clearly that the devil comes in while we sleep and sows bad seed and they come up tares. Why does God allow that to happen? I talked about that last week, so you need to watch last week's video. But that's what I mean. It's not just an understanding of the kingdom that you'll get. It's understanding about life, church, situations that you've been through. And all that is found when we actually preach and teach what Jesus preached and taught, which was the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. I even talk about in that first video about the difference between when you see in English the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Uh, they're the same words in the Greek, but it was intended for different audiences. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I explain all that in the first video about why you see the difference of the Lord using those words. Very important because you need to understand a little bit more about the writers of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. So again, I strongly encourage you to go back and watch this video series from the beginning so you can get all the information because I can't you know, possibly sum it up in a quick review here. So what happens to us many times, when, again, when I say us, I mean Western American Protestants. What happens to us many times is that what we learned was church work. When you first came into the kingdom or when you first got into a church or any type of organized so-called Christian Protestant religion, they probably told you, don't be a, a, a pew member. Don't be a bench warmer. Don't, don't sit out there in the congregation. You've got to get busy. You got to get busy. You got to get busy, okay? And so many times what they then taught you after that was church work. Whatever that and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with church work per se. But you know, driving a church van and organizing the kids and children's ministry and taking attendance and bringing food to people and stuff like that. Church work. Nothing wrong with that, because it needs to be done. But they never taught you the work of the church. The work of the church is found in Ephesians 4 and 11 and 12, and I want to read that to you. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, I'm reading out of the King James Version, King James Version. Ephesians in the New Testament, okay, one of the Pauline epistles, epistle means a letter. He wrote it to a church that was in a city called Ephesus. That's why it's called Ephesians, okay? So Ephesians chapter 4 Verses 11 and 12, it says, And he, meaning Christ, he gave some apostles and some prophets 
and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So right there, that verse tells you why God opened his hand and gave the fivefold ministry. I have an entire extensive teaching on fivefold ministry, by the way, and I'm about to release that. So stay tuned. I'll let you know when that's available because I go into detail on all this stuff about what each one of these offices are and all that. But anyway, he said he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That word there, perfecting, doesn't mean uh, perfect without flaw. It means maturing. It means to grow up for, so you can become fruit bearing, so you can become everything you're supposed to be. It says for the work of the ministry. Now, that's not talking about church work per se. That's a part of it. But that's talking about that word minister means to serve however it is you're supposed to serve God because there's some work to be done. OK, and then not just church work. And then it says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying means to build up. Okay? So that's the work of the church, to help you mature, to help you become fruit-bearing, to show you how you're supposed to serve God and your fellow man, which has to do with purpose, and to help build you up in Christ. That's the work of the church. And so many times people don't learn that. A whole lot of people don't know that. So they just end up with church work. And that's how you meet people uh, that have been going to church for like 30 years and they haven't changed. They're still the same person that they were 30 years, of, years ago because what many of us have perfected is churching. You know how there's club rats and there's hood rats? Uh, there's church rats. <laughs> and then some people have just perfected churching. They know how to church and they know how to church well. They know how to wear the right clothes. They know how to say the right words. They know how to wear the right hats. They know how to shout the right way. They know how to connect with the right people. They, they know how to be churchy, okay? But we haven't learned the work of the church, okay? So, so I said all that to say that that is why it's so important that instead of preaching and teaching what we've been preaching and teaching, which is born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, Go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die, which the Lord did not preach that. It's important that we preach what Jesus actually preached and taught, okay? So what I've been working on is, has been the uh, parables, the parables of the Lord. So <clears throat> some of the analogies that Jesus used in preaching the kingdom, parable of the sower, wheat and tares, mustard seed, parable of the yeast or the leaven, hidden treasure, a pearl of great price, a dragnet, uh, managing business accounts, uh, day laborers, inviting guests to a wedding, wise and foolish virgins, and business investing with talents. The Lord used all those parables to teach about the kingdom. So I'm going through each one of those and I'm breaking them down one by one. I thought at one point I would be able to get maybe like in two a session, but I can really only get one in a session. So I'm going through all of those and we're breaking down what the Lord is saying, and when we do that, we get much greater uh, understanding and insight as to not only how we're supposed to live as Christians, but how the kingdom works and how life works. So tonight, what I'm going to talk about is the parable of the mustard seed, okay? I'm going to talk about the parable of the mustard seed. And in the verses we're looking at, it's only two verses, but they're very, very powerful. Now, I'm sure you've heard many different takes, many different uh, exegesis is. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard many different sermons on the mustard seed, but tonight hopefully you can gain some new insight and you can gain some practical ways to apply it to your life. So again, I will say anybody that's watching me, when you come on, please like and share. Please like and share this video um, and so we can get the word out, okay? All right, so let's look at our uh, base scripture tonight. Our base scripture tonight is going to be Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. Okay? We're going to read from the book of Matthew. Now, Matthew, the book of Matthew is the first book in what we call the New Testament. Okay? The first book in the New Testament written by Matthew, which is one of Jesus' twelve, one of the twelve men that followed him. 
and uh, he was a former tax collector. And his perspective is uh, very, very unique and interesting when you read Matthew's book. So we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. I'm going to start with uh, the New King James, but I'm going to read many different versions. So here come, verses, here come Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. Another parable, another parable he, meaning Jesus, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Verse 32, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Whew, I need to read that again because they're action-packed. Okay, I'm going to read, uh, let's read out of the Berean Literal Bible. He put before them another parable, saying, The kingdom of the heavens is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man having taken sowed in his field, which indeed is smallest of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and encamp in its branches. Okay? There's a lot to unpack there, so let's dive right in. Okay? The first thing that I want to look at is, it says he put uh, before them another parable saying the kingdom of the heavens. I want to look at that word heaven. Okay? That word heaven coming out of the Greek, uh, and you can look this up yourself. It's in Strong's Concordance, uh, reference 3772. Strong's Concordance. A reference uh, in the New Testament, 3772. That word there is uranos, uranos, and it means heaven or the visible heavens, the atmosphere, the sky, the starry heavens, the spiritual heavens. But it also means, um, by implication, happiness, power, eternity. So in other words, when the Lord says the kingdom of heaven, you can also say the kingdom of the heavens. You can also say the kingdom of happiness. You can also say the kingdom of power. And you can also say the kingdom of eternity. Now, why did I want to look at that and why is that so important? This is why the Lord is always trying to tell people and tell his own people to invest in his kingdom. Because in his kingdom, his kingdom is actually the kingdom where you'll find happiness. In his kingdom is the kingdom where you'll actually find power. Power to overcome the challenges of life. In his kingdom, it's the kingdom of eternity. And that's one of my favorite interpretations of that word heaven. So when Jesus said the kingdom of eternity is like, why is that so important? Because no matter how long you live on earth, even if you live a long and full life, even if you live into your hundreds, what is a hundred years compared to forever and ever and ever and ever? Amen. God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they have no beginning. I know that concept will hurt your brain. It hurts everybody's brain because everything we're conditioned to experience in life has a beginning, middle, and end. But God actually doesn't have a beginning. God always was. That means that God stretches eternally Back that way. He always was. He doesn't have a start. The Bible and the book of Genesis, book of Genesis starts when we start. <laughs> it starts pretty much with the creation week. And there's lots of debates about the amount of time between Genesis 1 and 2 and the beginning God created heavens and the earth. But anyway, Genesis, the Bible, pretty much kind of starts when we start. God doesn't have a start. So he stretches forever back that way. I know, I know. God also stretches forever out that way. So as far back as there is a back, there was always God because he didn't start. That is not a linear concept. Don't try to figure that out. You just have to accept that by faith. And as far as anything can stretch in the future, God always will be. So what he's saying is, is that his kingdom is eternal. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of eternity. You know what that means? That means that when God gives you anything out of his kingdom, it's going to last forever. 
Can I back that up in scripture and in life? Yes, I can. Abraham. God told Abraham he was going to become the father of many nations, and yea and verily, he is. Abraham is a father of Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Abraham also has a name, a name that hasn't faded. We still call him Father Abraham, and the Lord says he's going to sit down uh, at the marriage supper of the Lamb in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because when God gives you a name, your name is not going to fade. Abraham has a name. Isaac has a name. Jacob has a name. Sarah has a name. Uh, Rachel and Leah have names, the mothers of the tribes of Israel, and Bilhah and Zilpah, Jacob's four wives. Uh, Esther has a name. Ruth has a name. David the king, he's still considered the greatest king of Israel, under Jesus, of course. But King David still has a name. King Solomon has a name. Moses. Because when God gives you anything in his kingdom, it doesn't fade away. That's why he keeps telling us that we're supposed to invest in the kingdom of eternity. And if we invest in the kingdom of time, or just that which is temporal, then we're fools. That's why the Lord told the parable of the man, the rich man that had so much money, he had to tear down the barns he had and build new ones because he had so much stuff, he didn't have room to keep it all. And God said, fool. And the man looked up at God and said, God, why you call me a fool? And, then, and God said, because this night your soul is going to be required. You're going to die tonight. And then all that stuff you built, who's it going to belong to then? And then the Lord said, so is he that is not rich towards God. You're a fool. You haven't invested in the eternal kingdom. Because when God gives you stuff, it doesn't fade away. It doesn't fade away. When God puts a crown on your head, that crown is going to be just as shiny 10,000 years from now as it is the day he gave it to you. You see what I mean? So Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of happiness, the kingdom of power, the kingdom of eternity is like. Why aren't we preaching and teaching the kingdom of happiness, the kingdom of power, the kingdom of eternity? Because that's what the Lord taught. Okay? So he said, the kingdom of heaven is like, okay, that's a simile, because a metaphor is is, A is B, that's a metaphor, simile is A is like B, so he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, now a mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds that a, uh, a farmer could plant, now we want to look into our concordance, that is Strong's reference number 4615 in the New Testament. So 4615, and that word there is centipede. Centipede, and it means a mustard plant. Okay? Always used in connection with its seed. The smallest of all Palestinian seeds in common use. And a mustard seed really is tiny. It is really, really, really tiny. Okay? The mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds that a Palestinian farmer would sow in his field. Okay, uh, and then I'll tell you some more about what that says later. So, why is that so important? Because the Lord is saying that his kingdom is so powerful, he can just give you something that small. He can give you something so tiny, the tiniest seed of God's kingdom. And when it, when it grows up, it becomes the greatest of all, but I'll get there in a minute. So, what I want to say on that point is, is don't despise the word of God. Don't despise the blessing of God. Don't despise anything that God gives you, even though it might look small. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> Don't despise anything that God gives you, even though it might look small. It might start with something that you could barely hold on the tip of your index finger. It might start super small. I stopped by to tell you not to despise that because the Lord said his kingdom is like that. It's like taking something as small as a mustard seed. The Lord can just give you one word and then you can spend the next 40 years of your life trying to work that word out. When God, <clears throat> God told Abraham he's going to be the father of many nations, God called Abram at 75. Isaac wasn't born until Abraham was 100 and in between being Abram, and the time Isaac was born, God changed his name. It was 25 years before Isaac showed up. 25 years. But God gave Abram a word. 
God can just give you a word and it might seem tiny. Or let me tell you something else that, you know, happens because Bishop James just, just preached a powerful sermon about how Esau in the Bible gave up his birthright. God can give you so many gifts. For example, you know, you may not have the gift that you wanted, but maybe you know how to cook or you may not have the gift you wanted, but maybe you know how to play an instrument or you may not have the gift that you wanted. My father knew a man one time that was kind of functionally illiterate, except he was a math genius. And you could put any formula on a chalkboard and he could just go through and work it out like that because that was his gift. He couldn't read or write or do other things, but he had that. My father told me about that. Because whatever God gives you, it might seem small, it might be small when it starts out, okay? It can be tiny, but don't despise it because the Lord said his kingdom is like that. It starts out as a tiny seed, and then I want to go on and um, uh, finish the verse and we see what it grows into. But that's the point I want to make there, is that if you've got anything in your life from God, don't despise it. Do you know why a lot of people miss their blessing from God? Because you are looking for something great to fall out of the sky. You want, because I know that's true in the music industry, and I know that's true with many, many authors. You want this fantastic career to just fall out the sky. I wrote one book, and now here comes this great career. I wrote one song, or, you know, I had one stage show. I opened for a band, and now all of a sudden I got all these Grammys and all these platinum records, and I'm traveling all over the world like that. You're looking for something great to fall out the sky, but it might start out very, very small. That's how a whole lot of people have missed their blessing in life, because they're looking for a finished product. Do you know what Michael Jordan said? I read his first autobiography, and it completely changed my life. Michael Jordan said that he had met other basketball players that were just as talented, and some were more talented than he was, which if Jordan says he met some dudes who were more talented than him. But then Michael went on to say they didn't have the mental discipline to be champions. Oh, because Michael Jordan played six hours of basketball outside of regular practice. Because he took that basketball playing talent and he invested in it. He developed it. And he developed it until it blew up and made him the greatest player of all, very similar to what we're going to read tonight. Do you know why? Because he didn't despise the gift that he had. That's why. He didn't despise what he had from God. Okay? He didn't despise what he had. He took what he had and planted it and developed it until it became great. And that's why so many people in life are walking around not living the life they want, not living where they want to live, not driving what they want to drive, not wearing what you want to wear, and not being married to who you want to be married to. Do you know why? Because everything that God gave you, you, you might have done like Esau. You might have spit it back in God's face. You might have belittled it. You might have said, that ain't nothing. Because you keep looking for Oprah's life. <laughs> you keep saying that if someone comes in your life and they're not on Oprah's level, that they ain't nothing. That's incorrect. You keep saying if somebody comes in your life and they're not on Bishop Jake's level, that they ain't nothing. That's incorrect. But you've got to learn how not to despise the gifts that God gives you no matter how small they are or no matter how small they start. Okay? All right, so let's move on. <coughs> The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man, stop, which a man, which a man took and sowed in his field, stop, which a man, stop, which a man took and sowed in his field, stop. Why are those two points important? Why am I stopping there? Okay. You hear me say it all the time, but it bears repeating. I'm going to say it again here. That. You've got to take it and sow it. <laughs> you got to do something. You got to give the Holy Ghost something to work with. Now, uh, let me take you to another scripture right quick to, to bear that out. Right quick, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament. It's one of the Pauline epistles that he wrote to a church in Corinth. That's why it's called Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. 
out of the Berean Study Bible, it says, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. But notice what Paul said. Paul said, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it. Paul said, I planted it and Apollos watered it. So what's my point? My point there is which a man took and sowed in his field. You got to sow. That's my point. Because remember I told you my whole goal on these Thursday night teachings is to get you out of genie concept. Okay? If you go in your backyard, if you've got a yard or any, any, any type of earth or ground anywhere near where you are, you can walk up to that ground and bend over and put a real serious look on your face and say, give me some tomatoes. <laughs> and you can lean over and say, give me some tomatoes. And you can go out there every day and, and your neighbors start looking around and say, who's that in the backyard? Is that, is that David Taylor's backyard? What are, what are you screaming? He, he be talking about tomatoes? You can go out there every day until you're blue in the face talking about, give me some tomatoes. And the ground is just going to smile at you and say, don't bring me your need. Bring me some seed. Okay? You got to sow. Jesus says, which a man took and sowed in his field. You got to give the Holy Ghost something to work with. Now, in a practical sense, what does that mean? That means that any area you want to harvest in, you must sow in. If you want to grow spiritually, for example, if you have someone in the kingdom that you admire, if you admire your pastor or an apostle or a prophet or Someone in the kingdom that you admire and you see their anointing and you see the grace that's on them and you see them do what they do and they do it in the power of God. I stopped by to tell you that they didn't get there overnight. That's a lot of sowing, a lot of studying in the word, a lot of uh, late night, up early in the morning, reading the scriptures, talking to the Lord, walking with the Lord, a lot of purging by God, a lot of shaping and molding from the potter. Okay, because you don't just pop up somewhere spiritually, you have to sow into your spiritual life. Mentally, if you find somebody that's really educated, that's a lot of reading, a lot of going to school, okay? A lot of cracking of books, a lot of burning of the midnight oil, a lot of test taking, a lot of paper writing, a lot to get that information in. Uh, physically, if you want to get in shape, if you want to be healthy, if you want to develop your muscles, if you want to get cut or ripped or you want to tone up or whatever it is you're trying to do, you got to work out and you got to check your diet and see how you're eating. You don't just naturally get the body you want. You got to pay attention to how you're feeding it. You got to pay attention to how you're exercising. Okay? Relationships. If you see anybody that has a relationship that you want, I guarantee you they sowed into that relationship. Good God Almighty. I know what I'm talking about. If they have a good relationship, they sowed into that relationship. It didn't just happen like that. It didn't happen without sowing. So the Lord said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took. You got to do something. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. You got to do something. So get that idea out of your head that whatever it is you want in life is just going to fall out the sky. All finished, all done, all grown, wrapped, packaged, cellophane, shrink wrapped, bow, you know, with, tied with a bow. That's not God. That's not his kingdom. That is not how life works. Because out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, which a man took and sowed in his field. That also should explain to you why there's plenty of people that come to church every week and never get any kind of harvest. They never grow, they never change, because they never do the work. Pastors up there preaching, and pastors up there preaching hard, and pastors up there prophesying, and pastors up there singing and prophesying in the song, and pastors up there exegeting the word, and pastors up there talking about the Hebrew and the Greek, and pastors up there giving examples, and pastors preaching as hard as he or she knows how to preach. And the people saying, amen, yeah, amen, pastor, and then nothing in their life changes. You know why? Because they didn't take that word and sow it in their hearts and sow it in their life. That's why. Because you got to do something. One more time. Because you got to do something. What did I just say? Because you got to do something. The Lord said, you got to take it and sow it. I can't stress that enough, but we're going to move on, okay? So, that's verse 31, and now we're going to move on to verse 32. It said, which indeed is the least of all seeds. So, I explained that to you, that not to despise what God gives you. But then he says, but when it is grown, 
stop. The Lord said, but when it is grown, why is that so important? Because you have to give the seed of the word of God time and a chance to grow. No differently than you would for plants in the natural. So the Lord is talking about a natural plant, a mustard plant, starts off like that. But then he says, when it is grown, and a whole lot of people don't understand, they have not stayed with the word of God long enough for it to become fully grown. Let me say that again. They haven't stayed with the word of God long enough for it to become fully grown. They haven't stayed with the word of God long enough for it to become fully grown. Okay, especially people that are CMEs, Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter, they come to church three times a year. You're not going to grow spiritually like that. They haven't stayed with the Word of God long enough for it to grow. Now, what do I mean by that, stay with the Word of God? I mean, when you hear something preached or taught or prophesied or sung in your hearing, and it's something that God means for you, uh, and you know it's for, it's, for, it's for you, and you hear people say, I receive it, you have to really receive it. You got to believe it in your head. You got to say it. Your self-talk, the, the, the YouTube video that's playing in your head about your life, whatever it was, you have to replace it with what God said. And you have to start meditating, which is exactly what the word says, Joshua 1 and 8. You have to start meditating on what God said, and then you have to let it come out your mouth. You got to confess it. And then you got to let it sink down into your heart and your emotions. You got to let it sink down into your deeper depths. And then when you begin to do that with the word of God, you begin to make the choices of obedience. You begin to do what the Lord says do, and then it'll grow. That's why I keep trying to tell people, it's not magic. It's not magic. It's not magic for all of you that are out there looking for a quick fix to your marriage. You don't fix marriages that way. Marriages don't work that way. There's no such thing as a quick fix. Okay? You're going to have to deal with some stuff. Those of you out there listening to me that are looking for a quick fix to your children, okay? Ain't no quick fix. There is no quick fix, okay? You have to grow a baby, okay? The body is programmed to grow as long as you feed it and take care of it. The body is programmed to, go, to grow. But you got to feed that, that little heart, that tender heart. You got to feed that mind. You got to feed that soul. I had a chance to work with some kids the other day, and it was great. And I'm talking about some preschool kids, and we did some ABCs, and it was great. And those kids were smart. They were really smart. But you got to feed kids. You got to teach them concepts. You got to teach them language. You have to be fed, and then you grow, okay? And the Lord said, when it's grown, that means you got to, as the old folks used to say, you got to hang in there until you see what the end is going to be. I will go, I shall go, to see what the end is going to be. That's what old school people used to say and sing a lot. What that means is that you've got to stay with God long enough to see how this thing turns out. Okay? What's well, an example of that? Joseph in the Bible. Joseph had a vision of him being lifted up above his family at the age of 17. And then he got sold into slavery. And he was in a strange land for 13 years. God took 13 years to prepare and train Joseph. And then God lifted Joseph up and made him prime minister of Egypt and put him in charge of of all of the commerce, Joseph was second only to Pharaoh. But that's when he was 30, it was 13 years later, that the fullness of that vision manifested. Another example in the Bible is King David. King David was anointed to be king. At one point, Saul was still alive, and Samuel came to Jesse's house and anointed David, and it was years before David actually got on the throne because God was shaping him, molding him, growing him, and he had to fight Saul his predecessor, the man he was replacing, uh, Jesus. Jesus planted his body and his life on the cross. And he hung on the cross for six hours. They arrested the Lord on a Tuesday night and beat him and spit upon him and stripped his clothes off of him. They woke up Wednesday morning and beat him and spit upon him some more. And then at nine o'clock on Wednesday morning, they hung, the Lord, they hung the Lord on the cross. They nailed him to that cross, and he was on that cross from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. So the Lord was planting his body and planting his life, and then they took his dead body off the cross and put it in the ground. Three, day, three days later, the Lord resurrected. 
Then he walked on earth for 40 more days, and then he ascended into heaven, and now he is re-glorified. He is fully God and fully man, and that's what Apostle John saw in the book of Revelation when he saw Jesus with the eyes that burned like fire, and the royal diadem on his head, and the hair white like wool, and the golden girdle and feet like fine brass, and seven stars in his hand. That's what the Lord looks like now. So coming to earth, coming through Mary's womb, spending 30 years growing up to be a man, Three years in ministry, getting arrested, crucified, six hours on the cross, three days and three nights on the grave, 40 days with his friends. Then he ascended. See, even the Lord had to grow. He went from being that little uh, uh, fertilized egg and then that embryo, uh, that zygote, that fetus in Mary's womb, back to where he is now. Even the Lord, when he became a man, utilize his principle. He had to grow into everything that he is now. So stop thinking you can get saved on Friday and pastor a 3,000 member church on, on Monday. Stop thinking you can get saved on Saturday and you've attended to the title of chief apostle on Sunday. My pastor says, you know, there's people that, that want to be the archbishop and the archbishop deluxe with the big chain and, you know, uh, uh. it doesn't happen that way. So the Lord said when it's grown, and then he said, it is the greatest among the herbs, the greatest. So the Lord just told you that if you stick with the seed of his word, if you invest in his kingdom, when it gets fully grown, it's going to be greater than every other plant, every other kingdom. That's why he says when we don't invest in his kingdom, we fools. Because whatever you're investing in that's not the kingdom of God is eventually going to be the lesser in comparison to what God's kingdom is when it is fully mature. Okay? And that's how the devil fools so many people. He gets you hung up on the process in the middle. He gets you so hung up on the process, what's happening in the meantime. But the Lord said, when it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So in other words... Um, uh, and then I also uh, want to read to you Daniel 4.12. It says, Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit was abundant, and upon it was food for all. Under it the beasts of the field found shelter, in its branches the birds of the air nested, and from it every creature was fed. He's talking about the tree of life. So the point there, the point I'm bringing that up is to let you know that when the word of God becomes fully grown, and it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof, it means it's big enough and rich enough to sustain other forms of life. So in other words, what the Lord is saying, by the time the word of God gets to working in his kingdom, it's going to grow to be so big and so superior and so fruitful and abundant and life-giving that other uh, forms of life can come. So in other words, you'll be so enriched and so edified and, and so... Uh, abundant and fruit bearing that you can actually become a shelter for other people, other creatures, other forms of life. You can actually help and bless others once the kingdom of God gets through working in your life. Okay? But so many people don't want to hear that now. So many people, man, I was just talking about it today. So many people have just, you know, we got the social media mentality. We got, you know, First it was microwaves, then it was sound bites, and then it was tweets. <laughs> you know, we got to express ourselves in text, you know, text language, text speak, and 140 characters, 280 characters, and we have to do all these things. And now people have very small attention spans, and now people want everything to happen right now. And now we're used to a 24-hour uh, news cycle, and so now people are paying attention to what's popping next, you know, and this is the big thing, and this is the big story or whatever, and then they move on to the next. And so our attention spans are very, very small. That's a stark contrast to what the Lord said, because the Lord said, you've got to plant the seed, you've got to water the seed, you've got to give it some time, then you've got to let it grow, you've got to let it get fully grown. And a lot of people don't stay with God and his kingdom long enough to let it get fully mature. And that's a shame, because the Lord is already telling you what the end is going to be. It will become the greatest of the herbs. It will become a tree. You'll be able to nourish other people from it. It will be so great. Okay? So, uh, to sum up, the Lord said that this is what his kingdom is like. And this is why we need to preach. 
and teach what Jesus preached and taught, which is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Okay? That his kingdom is the kingdom of happiness, power, and eternity. Okay? His kingdom, uh, we, we're not supposed to despise whatever God gives us, no matter how small it is when it starts. That we have to plant it. You've got to take what God gave you, and you've got to plant it in the field. And you've got to water it. So stop expecting the Holy Ghost to do your work for you, because he won't. Okay? And even though it's the smallest of seeds, it becomes the greatest of herbs. It becomes a tree. It becomes so big and so rich and so full that other life forms can be nourished by it. Now, if God said that's what his kingdom is like, then that's what his kingdom is like. That means you shouldn't expect it to be any other way. You should expect it to be exactly the way the Lord said it is. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to adjust expectations. I'm trying to get you off of whatever concept you had of Father and Jesus and the Holy Ghost and his kingdom and being saved. Let's throw out whatever concepts we've been holding on to and let's latch on to what the Lord said. And the Lord said, this is what his kingdom is like. So that means I'm not going to despise any gift that God gives me, no matter how small it is, and no matter how small it is when it starts. That means I'm going to work what God gave me. I'm going to work my field. I'm going to plant my seeds. I'm going to water my seeds. I'm going to work my ground. That means i got to give it time because it's got to grow. But that means I can have an expected end, which is what the Lord said. I can expect that when that thing is fully grown, after I've, I've invested in God's kingdom and done what the Lord said, by the time that thing gets done, It'll be the greatest of all the herbs. So that needs to be our expectation. So let's apply that to our lives. If you want to have the greatest marriage in your family, you want your marriage to be the bomb.com, that means you cannot despise the word of God. you got to take whatever word God gives you over your marriage, the words in scripture, and whatever the Lord speaks to you, and whatever ring of words come prophetically, and you got to take those words and you got to plant them. Plant them in your head, plant them in your heart, plant them in your mouth, plant them in your home, and then you've got to give it time. You've got to keep sowing. You've got to keep watering. You've got to give it some time and let it grow. And over time, your marriage will grow into a thing that's so beautiful and, and rich that it can feed other people. The Lord said that's how his kingdom works. So that, that will work with money. That will work with your ministry. That will work with your job, your profession. That will work anywhere that you are taking the word of God and planting it and staying with it long enough to let it grow. So that's why we ought to preach and teach what Jesus preached and taught. Because what, uh, what the Lord preached and taught explains how his kingdom works. And that also explains why a whole lot of Christians aren't getting the results they want. Because they keep saying, I want a breakthrough. Of course you want a breakthrough, but you got to keep sowing and planting water, and you got to keep going till you get a, a breakthrough. Many times what you mean is you want a genie concept. You want magic. You just want the heavens to open. you got to sow, <laughs> okay? And you got to give the Lord something to work with, okay? Amen and amen. Okay, so I hope that was a blessing to you. And uh, if you'd like to sow into my ministry, I normally put my cash up and my Zelle up there. Um, I know uh, Benny Hinn recently was talking about some stuff about uh, about what he was going through or whatever, but I stopped by to tell you that the Lord says you're supposed to sow into his kingdom. You're supposed to bless those that bless you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together. Good measure running over shall men give into your bosom. The Lord says, shall a man rob God, but ye have robbed me how? In tithes and offerings. Bring ye all the tithes into the offerings that the, into my house, that there be meat in my house. And prove me now therewith, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that you should not have room enough to receive it. So God says, when we don't pay tithes and offerings, we're robbing him. Okay? So I go by what the words say. I'm not going by what people say. And God said that when we're not taking our 10% into his house and when we're not giving offerings, we're robbing him. And he also says in the verses that he will rebuke the devourer for our sakes. This is Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. He'll rebuke the devourer for our sakes. That means if you're not paying tithes and offerings, that means there's a devourer out there that's eating up harvests and crops, and God is not going to stop him from eating up your harvest and your crop. That only happens for those that pay tithes and offerings. That's what the words say, so I don't care what people say. Okay? 
So uh, my cash up and my Zelle's up there if you'd like to sell to my ministry. Now, what I'm going to do now is when you see me close my eyes and pray in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there any physical healing that needs to go out? Is there any deliverance, any demons we need to cast out? Uh, are there any financial prophetic words? And are there any other prophetic words he wants me to release? Okay, so that's what we're going to do now. Also, if you have a prayer request, put it on the screen. If there's something you want me to pray for, put it on the screen. Now, I can't always see all everything uh, because neither Periscope nor Facebook Live allows me to see all of the messages. So if you put it up there and I don't pray for it while I'm live, it's just because I didn't see it. But put it up there and then when I stop the broadcast, I'm going to go back and check. And then I'll be sure to pray for whatever you put up there. So you can always you know, post a prayer request up there and I'll pray for it. When I see it, I just may not see it scroll past me during the, during the live broadcast, okay? All right, here we go. All right, the Spirit of God told me that there's somebody out there watching me that's lame in their feet. I stopped by to tell you that today is your day. Let me make sure I don't turn this off. Put your hand on the screen, okay? Put one hand on the screen and put one hand on your leg if you can't reach your feet and say, in the name of Jesus, I command uh, the power of God because by his stripes I am healed. And, and, and I claim that by his stripes that I'm healed and I speak life to my feet. I command my feet to be 100% whole, ligaments, joints, muscles, bones, blood vessels, and I command life to come into my feet right now in Jesus' name. It's your day to get up. Get up off them crutches. Get up off that bed and walk. All right, the Lord is uh, telling me to remind everybody that this is harvest season. We're in the harvest season, and now is the time for you to gather in. Uh, I just talked about it uh, last Sunday in my broadcast, but be sure that you are harvesting everything God means for you to harvest during this season. And be sure that you're sowing unto the next season, okay? Be sure that you are getting ready for 2020. You're supposed to be getting ready for 2020 now. And that's what's been coming forth through the prophetic word. That's why you need the prophetic in your life, because God will always tell you what's going to happen. God already, what's my tagline? God already told you what was going to happen if you just listened to his servants, the prophets. God will always get you ready for the next phase, okay, while you're in the current phase. Okay, there's a prophetic word the Holy Ghost wants me to release. For behold, my people, the days come and now are where there is a season of full harvest in your life. Do not be afraid that full harvest is from me, but as I send you opportunities, as I send you moments, as I send you people and connections, open, open up your hands, open up your heart, open up your mind, open and receive. For I'm a God of abundance. I'm a God of riches and wealth. I'm a God that gives good gifts to his children. I'm a God that wants to see you prosper because I have pleasure in the prosperity of my servants. So open open and as I send you gifts, as I send you harvest, as I send you abundance, receive that you do not miss anything that I have for you in this season, says the spirit of the living God. Wow. I received that. I'm going to act on that. Go going to walk in that because remember I tell you every week, there's nothing that I'm preaching and teaching to you that I'm not doing myself. Okay. Because the word of God is to me first. Okay. So yeah, I received that. So whatever the Lord, I've been September has been a great month. I've been receiving some stuff, and I'm going to keep on receiving. So if the Lord said he's got more, I'm down with the more. I'm, I'm ready to open, all right? So amen and God bless. Thank you so much for tuning in live, those of you that watch live. Thank you so much for those of you that are watching on the replay. And remember to please like and share. Remember, we need this video to go around the world. Whenever the Lord releases a prophetic word, a prophetic teaching, or preaching, as many people as possible need to see it because they're going to be blessed by it. They need to hear the word of God that will help them with whatever they're struggling or dealing with. That's why the Lord gives us prophets. Remember, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. God gives us that so people can be built up, okay, so that we can become mature in Christ and in the kingdom. Okay, that's the whole point. That's the work of the church. So please like and share this video so that whoever needs to be blessed by it can see it. All right? Amen and God bless. Now, I will be back on Sunday, my regular time, 
2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I do a weekly live prophetic word. Same place as Facebook Live, Periscope, and then I'll put the replay on YouTube. Okay, so I'll be here Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time with a prophetic word for then. And then I'll be here next month. Let's look at our date. I'll be on the second Thursday of October, which is the 10th. Okay, so I'll be back teaching the next part of this series on Thursday, October 10th, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Facebook Live Periscope replay on YouTube. Okay? Amen. God bless. Have a good rest of your week. Remember that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. So whatever seeds God gives us, we want to plant them, and we can expect them to grow and become the greatest plant of all. All right? Amen, and God bless.